Welcome, everyone. We have a special show today. We're going to be talking about psilocybin. You ever heard of it? P-S-I-L-O. C-Y-B-I-N for those listening on the audio podcast. It's a psychedelic and how they're using it for treatment. Today we have Dr. David J. Hellerstein, MD, the research psychiatrist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, New York, uh, New York, and professor of clinical psychiatry at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center. So I think we got the right person because he also specializes in research and treatment of mood and anxiety disorders, particularly the medication treatment of chronic depression, and he's currently studying right now psilocybin and treatment-resistant depression. Let's not waste any more time, and welcome Dr. Hellerstein to the show. Welcome, doctor. Uh, thank you. Thanks for much, for much for having me today. Thank you very much for being here. This has been a fascinating topic because a lot of people have a lot of assumptions and beliefs and schemas about um, psychedelics and things of that nature, but before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit about what is treatment-resistant depression? Uh, sure. Treatment-resistant depression is depression that has not responded to treatments, and it's defined different ways in different studies. But uh, generally, it means depression has not responded to several adequate trials of antidepressant medicine. So the studies that we're doing right now, it's two to four treatments have not worked to alleviate the symptoms of depression. Because yeah, a lot of people sometimes think if they take an SSRI like Zoloft or something like that, that it's going to work all the time, <laughs> but in reality, it doesn't. Right. Any one medicine will work probably half to two thirds of the time. So you get oh, wow. you know, people who haven't responded to the first couple of medicines, you know, two thirds respond to the first, two thirds respond to the second. So it's a subset of a subset that haven't responded to several different medicines, but they have a condition that's quite uh, disabling and difficult to treat, obviously. Absolutely. So I can't wait to start because I know a lot of people sometimes in the psychology world, well, it depends, I guess, how old you are, but they may remember Baba Ram Dass and Tim Leary and, right. and the use of LSD way back when. But tell us how you got started on psilocybin and studying this. Well, so the um, last several years, there's been a renaissance of psychedelic studies, and uh, they were uh, uh, classified in 1970 during the Nixon administration as Schedule One which meant drugs that had no legitimate medical use and were dangerous. And there's been a, a, a series of studies by really brave investigators who have looked at studying these drugs um, as possible treatments uh, for different psychiatric disorders. And basically they convinced the FDA that they were worthy of study. So a couple of years ago, the FDA actually gave psilocybin an indication for rapid development. And so therefore several companies have kind of jumped into the fray to try to develop it as a, as a FDA approvable medication. So it's an amazing thing to go from a reviled and illegal drug that could land you in jail to something that's really a hot new potential treatment for psychiatric disorders, especially difficult to treat conditions like treatment resistant depression. So we're one of the sites for a multi-site study, which is being conducted by Compass Pathways. Um, the other company that's doing studies is called Usonia uh, Enter, uh, Institute, Usonia Institute, and they're doing a very similar pathway of trying to get psilocybin for major depression. The COMPASS study is treatment-resistant depression, but they're very similar studies, and they're following the traditional FDA approval pathway of going through different phases of study, phase one, two, and three, to, to then get into the open marketplace. And, and as I said, it's an amazing thing, this, this turnaround. Hopefully this, these will jump through all the appropriate hoops and move forward. So we've been part of the study for about the last year and a half and um, have, have at this point treated about 20 people. Oh, wow. I guess, and I'm not sure how much information you have on this yet, but do we know the mechanism of action of psilocybin? So the classical psychedelic drugs, which would be uh, LSD, uh, which was synthesized uh, in, in Europe uh, over a half a century ago, and psilocybin um, and some other drugs, they work through something called the serotonin system, uh, a receptor called the 5-HT2A receptor, which is different than the part of the serotonin system that drugs like Prozac and Zoloft work on. Those are reuptake inhibitors. They block the 
inactivation of serotonin, whereas the psychedelic drugs are stimulants to the 5-HT2A receptor, and they produce this very strange, uh, amazing kind of uh, cascade of symptoms. But the thing that's weird is like Timothy Leary, you know, could he have imagined that we'd be studying this 50 years later as a treatment for, uh, you know, neuropsychiatric disorders that really have baffled our current treatment uh, options? Yeah, it would have been a different world if this would have happened back then for him. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Um, so does it increase, so it increases, the, is it an agonist for serotonin or an agonist so for dopamine? Agonist, well? it's, it's an agonist. So it, what, you know, the funny thing, if you look at the molecule, and you, anybody can look on Wikipedia, serotonin molecule, and compare it to psilocin, which is the active uh, ingredient of psilocybin, it's metabolized to psilocin. And if you look at those two molecules, they're almost identical. There's a side chain that's in a slightly different place in the psilocin molecule. And what happens is this drug goes in and it binds to the serotonin receptor, but your brain has like never seen this stuff before. So it's binding to the receptor and it sets off this it's like all alarms going off at one time. It's, it's, it, you know, and, and the, the experiences that people have seeing things, hearing things, talking to their dead grandmother, talking to God, watching themselves be reborn are indications of kind of a, a wild effect upon brain connections and networks that lasts for several hours and then kind of fades away. But, but it's, this, it's this connection of this almost identical molecule to a receptor that has played a major role throughout our lives that suddenly is like, I don't know what to do with this stuff and all the alarms are going off. And so people experience it in hopefully a positive way. Uh, sometimes they relive trauma, it can be negative or scary, but um, then it seems to have downstream effects even after the drugs out of the body that affects the brain, its functioning, connectivity and circuitry in a way that enables people possibly to then get better from their, from their disorder. Yeah. Well, for your, I got tons of questions now. <laughs> yeah, sorry to throw it all out at once, but it's, a, it's such great. a cool area. <laughs> one, of my, one of my colleagues was, I was talking to her, we we're trying to develop a study for eating disorders. And she said, wow, I really love psychedelics. And I looked at her and I said like, she said, no, no, I don't mean taking them. I mean, studying them. They're such interesting molecules. So they're kind of being pulled out of the garbage bin of, of psychopharmacology. And like looking at a new, we're saying like, these are the most amazing, cool, complex, but possibly breakthrough types of treatments. It's amazing because they, I mean, I'm not one to say, oh, it's natural. And so it's okay to take things because some people will use that as a, as a cover, right? Oh, this is a natural substance. There's a lot of natural substances. Well, so is cyanide and, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, you know exactly. those are natural. But they've been taking this, uh, some psychedelics for a long time, a lot of different cultures. Um, I guess I'll ask this question, even though this wasn't I was, what I was going to ask first, but it's all right. Are the doses different? Are they really small doses? Like I know when ketamine is being tested for treatment-resistant depression, it's really small doses of ketamine. Is it the same with psilocybin? Um, no, these are, you know, the, the, um, the doses used for, for treatment are generally full psychedelic doses. So, wow. you know, the cultural use of psychedelic drugs, peyote, mescaline, um, uh, ayahuasca, which is a fascinating compound, a com combination of two drugs that indigenous healers figured out gave a really cool trip. And they've been used in religious rituals and spiritual development and personal development in various cultures throughout the world for thousands of years. And so the, the kind of indigenous knowledge of how to use these drugs was that you actually had to have a full trip in order for the maximum benefit to occur. So actually the studies are pretty much using the same dose. So the study we're part of, there is a, a microdose comparison, but that's supposed to be inactive, one milligram. And then there's a five, uh, sorry, 10 milligram and 25 milligram. 10 is a pretty good dose and 25 is, is a pretty big dose. And most of the studies, the psychedelic studies have been in, in the 10 to 25, maybe even 30 milligram range, which will give somebody a pretty robust uh, psychedelic experience. Wow. And I guess my next question is what areas of the brain does it target? Does it target particularly? It sounds like it starts to hit the temporal lobes a little bit there. So, so the, the, um, the fascinating thing that the, there have been a, a number of studies with psychedelic drugs, uh, psilocybin, LSD, using MRI and other kinds of brain imaging 
technologies that can look at the brain connectivity and patterns of activity throughout the brain over time. So you're watching kind of, or recreating the brain's actual activity through the flow of oxygen, uh, uh, use of oxygen in different parts of the brain. And what happens is like I was saying, it's like all hands on deck or emergency alarm going off that the, during the acute trip, there's changes from very low activity to very high activity. And then the network connections, they, the brain is connecting in ways it's probably never connected before. So parts of the brain are talking to each other during a trip that would not normally be communicating. And so that's why, you know, that's one explanation of why you would have these strange experiences where you're seeing and hearing things and tasting things. You know, have synesthesia is one common experience that you're, you're um, experiencing melding together of different sensations and different ways to perceive and experience things in a way you, you don't normally have. And then seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, re-experiencing, you know, things that normally would be maybe suppressed or out of your conscious awareness. People experience those things, re-experience them as though they're happening again. And, and one really important thing about the, the, the research is, and, and actually this goes back to Timothy Leary, it was called set and setting. So the mindset of the person taking the drug and the setting, which is a safe environment in which to take the drug, Timothy Leary wrote a great paper about that back in the early 60s. So people still cite that today. He wasn't the originator of the idea, but he was summarizing that. And so the context in which you take the drug is very important as opposed to taking it while you're at a club downtown or at a rave or something like that. That's a different experience. I wouldn't recommend it for people who have treatment resistant depression to, to take those drugs in an uncontrolled setting. So we have a very highly controlled setting in which the patient is prepared over several sessions, meeting the therapist beforehand, you know, going through what kind of experience they may expect, watching videos, and then they are put in a room with two therapists who are there for the entire eight-hour trip, and they're listening to a, 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 a soundtrack, a, a playlist, um, and actually most of the, each of the groups has its own playlist, each of the companies that's studying these. It's a sort of spa-like kind of playlist to to sort of maximize the experience. People wear eye shades because the uh, psychedelic experience often uh, there's photosensitivity. People are very, very uh, sensitive to light and they need to be in darkness. So they have earphones on, they have eye shades. And actually now that we're in the middle of COVID, they have a mask on. <laughs> so they're, they're kind of like it's in a space, but they're there with two very well-trained therapists and who are there with them from part start to finish. And then the next day, the therapist meet with them again and help them process the experience. So to get a therapeutic effect, you're hoping that not only will they go through the psychedelic mind kind of bending experience, but then they'll be working with an experienced therapist or therapist who will help them process those, those experiences in a way that could help them with their um, disorder. And, and to, to get back to your question about the, what effects on brain networks, so it looks like there's this explosion of activity during the trip. Um, and then there's a long-term effect, long-term effects that we don't really completely understand. But the thinking is that there's a state of entropy and then a state of plasticity. So entropy is kind of chaotic and, and disorder or structured disorder. And then the plasticity would be afterwards that would allow the brain to maybe reform its connections and network activity. And one of the really imp important things and interesting things about um, new neuropsychiatry, which is our current age of psychiatry, is that we understand the importance of brain circuitry and that a lot of disorders are actually the result of overconnected brain circuits. So that are, it's like what we used to think, that, you know, you remember what a record is. I remember what a record is. I don't know if the <laughs> current generations, they, some of them collect a piece, but you can have a record that is, that is scratched and it, it plays the same track over and over again. And that's in a sense what some people think, researchers think that may happen in OCD, depression, PTSD, different disorders. People are playing the same circuit over and over again. And there's circuits in the brain. There's something called the default mode network which is a set of circuits in the brain that are related to your self-thought, self-appraisal, and how you feel about yourself connected 
to the world. And in depression, those feelings are fixed in the broken record in a negative way. So the person's thinking, I'm a bad person, I'm worthless, I'm hopeless, I have no future, why am I in this world, it'd be better without me. Those are cycles of thought that they may have that they can't break out of. They can with medication, that can help. And with psychotherapy, that can help them challenge. Um, but those take a lot of time and a lot of work about the psychedelics out. We don't still know they're going to pan out is that it looks like it may, those drugs may break the circuits and allow the, um, the connectivity to change and become more flexible and more positive in a way. And that's where the psychotherapy helping people with the new plasticity of their brain after the treatment to process things in a more adaptive, helpful way, and then hopefully move on to more positive experiences. So the treatment resistant depression state is a stuck state. It's a broken record state for a lot of people. And the hope is, can we use these drugs to help people get back to more normal uh, plasticity and, and way of living in the world? So to me, it's, like a super, it's so cool, right? Isn't it a cool great explanation? Yeah. It's, cool era. it's funny because you've mentioned that because I'm noticing a lot of, I'm doing some research right now. I deal more with the world of criminal psychopathology on the side right now. And it's interesting because I read a lot of the, the articles in neuroscience and see a lot of talk about functional connectivity. And between the amygdala in my area, I'm looking at amygdala and prefrontal cortex connectivity for psychopaths, but it's really fascinating. That's you're right, absolutely so right. That's what it looks like that's the direction we've been in for a while in neuroscience, at least. So it's like it's like, can you tune the circuits of the brain? You know, that's kind of the, the thing. And we may try and fail. I, I think it's not a done deal yet. We don't know for sure. That's why you do research, you don't know the answer, but that's kind of the the challenge. And you know, ketamine, you mentioned that that's also a drug that has some psych psychoactive and psychedelic effects. People are comparing that, studying that as a way to treat um, addiction and depression and so on. It's also sometimes combined with psychotherapy. Um, TMS, which is brain stimulation using magnetic stimulation, they're focusing that on brain circuits too. So our new kind of model or paradigm for psychiatric research is looking at brain circuits that we think are, are misconnected or um, have gotten connected in a way that is bad, bad for the person, like habit circuits in addiction or OCD or um, uh, uh, eating disorders, those seem to be circuits that also are very stuck. So it's different circuits for different types of disorders and trying to get them unstuck in a way that can be adaptive. Now, I think, you know, um, uh, uh, Charles Manson, his acolytes used LSD too. So the plasticity may not necessarily always be good. I think mold, molding it and modeling it in a healthy way would be the, the best way to do it. I think Charles Manson did it in a, in a demonic kind of way. He's a whole, uh, <laughs> he's a whole different creature. <laughs> no, no, but he was a, he uh, was a, so it's, it's, these are tools. These are tools that could be used for good or evil. I, I think the point is we should be as scientists looking at them as a way to try to, to use them therapeutically to, to treat people in a helpful way. They do have risk sides. So that's the other piece of any new treatment or, or drug, device, whatever. You want to know the risks and the benefits. So that's another thing that the new era of psychiatry research is we can really look at the risks for people with these disorders. Because a college kid who takes some mushrooms to go to a concert, that kid has some risks, but they're different than a person with treatment resistant depression who might've been suicidal, who's now off their antidepressants and having a trip. You really want good clinicians, good doctors, good staff to be helping that person out. Because if their brain is plastic, they could be really struggling if they're not really supported in the right way. So it's, a non, it's not a trivial thing. You don't just like, let's give everybody mushrooms and everybody's going to be fine. That's a great point. I want to make that, I want to also uh, emphasize people don't self-medicate. Make sure you contact an expert. Don't do that. It's one of the biggest things I see a lot, and I'm sure you do as well. People, well, I have bipolar disorder, which I'm assuming would not be the greatest thing right now. And they'll start, oh, he said psilocybin was good. <laughs> I'll take mushrooms. I, I, right. I think one has to really caution there, you know, there certainly are ethical providers who've been doing this work in the underground, but um, it is illegal. People can go to jail for referring even people to those treatments and certainly providing the treatments. 
but also you don't know what you're getting if you're getting treatment in, a, in an underground setting. And I think people with these disorders going to a ayahuasca ceremony or something, you know, the people who are running the ceremonies don't necessarily know what do you do with treatment resistant depression, PTSD, OCD, suicidality. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a significant risk that people are urgently wanting to get ahead of the data. I think as a, as a doctor, a scientist, a researcher, whatever, I would like, yes, let's wait, let's get the evidence. Let's, you know, it's gonna be a couple of years. Let's just do the work and then we can provide them in a rational way. Um, you know, I don't think anybody's saying stop the native healers from doing their rituals. I think that's a whole thing in itself, that's cool. But I'm talking about the medical use, which I think needs to be thought through very carefully. Absolutely, great points. I have a few more questions if that's okay with you. Sure. I know we definitely have a lot of people that we would love to have lived right now during this time. <laughs> Baba Ramdas would have loved this. Uh, Aldu Huxley would have been happy about this as well. Okay. Um, let me ask you this, a couple things. Uh, how fast does it work? SSRI, as we know, can take a while to start building up. Uh, is psilocybin work pretty quickly? So the, the response seems to be within the first several days to, to week or so. Oh, wow. And so I think that's different then um, SSRIs take weeks to months to work. And the, uh, the closest thing I would say is, is ketamine, which people can get a response very quickly. Um, also ECT, shock treatment, people can have very quick response sometimes. But it's, it's a different model where you're disrupting these circuits very quickly and are seeing effects that can come on within the first, sometimes hours to days, sometimes within the first couple of weeks. Um, and, and again, oh, he, he, I would say one other thing, which is really important about the research. These are hard drugs to study because people are coming in with such expectations. Everybody's read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. They've watched the videos. They've seen this and that. They, they've read all the stories in the books and, and magazine articles. Their expectation is so high. It's very hard to study these drugs because the placebo effect, the expectation effect is very high. And so to really find the true medication effect compared to placebo is hard. And it's hard to even find a placebo because people can figure out if they're on the placebo or the active medicine a lot of the time. So to really find the true benefit of the drug is, is complicated. So it's hard to study these drugs. So that's why you know, I think really doing good research, trying to figure out how to do the good research and then figuring out what's the benefit for whom and what setting then I think we can really maximize the, the potential of these drugs. It's a great point, it's a great point. How about root of administration? How is it taken? Um, so these, the, the um, psilocybin is just taken by mouth. You know, it's, it's, it's swallowed um, and it, it uh, has pretty rapid effects within you know, half an hour or less. People start to feel some of these experiences. Oh, wow. Now, do you think you see? And, and by the way, it's out of the body. By you know, we have an eight-hour, you know, day or eight, an eight or nine-hour day. By the time the person leaves, their trip is over. So it actually has that's that's psilocybin. LSD lasts somewhat longer. Other psychedelics, DMT, lasts shorter. So different drugs have different length of effect. But that's kind of an advantage of psilocybin that it can be in and out within a um, you know the person's system within a. Uh, you know, six or so hour period, time period. I was going to ask you this one, but I think I'll, I'll pass. I was just going to ask you if, you if you could foresee, I guess, <laughs> if you could foresee if you could be Nostradamus here and, and see any combination of drugs used with it. You know, sometimes it'll mix benzos with something else or anything of that nature. But do you see, do you ever foresee any other drugs working with it? Or? I don't know about combinations. I think the, the one, one thing we really don't know at all is which drug is what's best for which condition and how many treatments to do. So for instance, some of the depression studies have done one treatment, some have done two. OCD, some of the studies have done two. Um, there were studies back in the, in the 50s and 60s where people got a lot more doses. Um, so how many doses do you need to get the person out of the, the abnormal state they're in, the depression, whatever? And then what about maintenance? And what about preventing relapse or getting worse again? And we just don't know. So it's a, it's a frontier for those of us who like to do this kind of research. We're like, wow, this is really cool. We do not know the best way to give these drugs to help these people with these disorders 
to help them get out of the depression or PTSD or OCD and help them stay better over a period of time. Amazing stuff. I mean, I'm so glad you guys are doing the work on this. This is really, really, like you said, it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. I guess my last question, I also want to make a, t a comment too. I guess when you said you guys play music in the, in the room. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's a playlist. Yeah. So. It isn't Lucy in the sky with diamonds, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I think not. No. <laughs> but I think we could all come up with our playlist depending on what, what decade we, we uh, were teenagers. <laughs> well, I, I would actually, probably avoid heavy metal. I think soothing, uh, you know, uh, coffee music is probably the, the way to go. <laughs> I guess my kind of good segue, are there, have you seen, or do you think there's going to be any issues with regards to different ages because of the development of the brain? So an 18 year old compared to a 30 year old, anything of that nature or not? Um, I think that's another fascinating question because the brain is so different through different phases of life. So teenagers have so many more brain cells and connections and older people, you know, not including us, right? <laughs> they have a lot fewer brain cells and less connections, but they're more rigid and more formed. So what's the, what's the effects of these drugs across the, the age span, especially for people with diagnoses and disorders? One of the interesting studies, actually a couple of them have been with people with um, uh, terminal cancer and NYU and Johns Hopkins have done studies of those people who um, tolerated the drugs very well. And those are mostly older people, right? Because they're people with advanced cancer. So, and they're people who are medically ill, medically frail, a lot of other conditions on lots of medications. They tolerated the drugs well. They didn't have a lot of uh, toxicity or bad outcomes. And a lot of them actually experienced it as one of the most meaningful life experiences that ever, they'd ever had. So these were not Grateful Dead, uh, you know, road trippers. <laughs> these, were, these were regular solid citizens who generally had not taken a lot of, of, of psychedelics before. And they experienced it in a very positive way, but they were medically frail older people and didn't seem to have any medical um, morbidity as we call it. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. Dr. Hallerstein, folks, again, professor of clinical psychiatry at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center and research psychiatrist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. That was really fascinating, Dr. Hallerstein. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Carlos, thanks so much. It's really fun to get a chance to talk about this, and it was nice to meet you, and I hope, for, hope to hear what your audience uh, has to say about this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm curious to see what they have to say. Folks, by the way, make sure to share and subscribe and hit that like button on whatever platform you are to support our podcast. We thank you all for listening.